Good morning, Ms. Finest Jung. We're going to continue the saga of my life. It's like a movie. Uh, so I left you in um, 1980, put uh, $100,000 into my Chamber Valley USA, which turned out to be a successful company and resulted in two managers. Um, but at that time also, the, the ballet world, you know, Burshnikov had arrived, he was here. Um, but the National Endowment for the Arts stopped funding ballet companies, so there we were. After I spent all that, there, there was no work for them. So, 1986, I think, okay, now I have to pay attention. What am I going to do? Let's do it because the real estate taxes were really very high. <clears throat> so I bring in someone named Jean, you know, that we know today, and his class at noon is soon packed, packed, wall to wall. Students, all these actors mainly and musicians. Hmm? So he is so successful that he goes around the corner, right around the corner, <clears throat> and opens up his own studio and takes all the students with him. So there goes half of my income, because by this time, you know, uh, Step Studio had opened up, and there were studios downtown, Perry Dance had opened up. So it, wasn't, it was no longer just David Howard and Maggie Black and me teaching professionals. There were other people in on the game. So the, the number of students started to get smaller and smaller. And uh, so I started to think, okay, what am I gonna do? I have to make some money here, because I'm still a uh, single parent. By that time I'm divorced, I'm, I'm single parenting Jason. Uh, plus I have to pay the rent. So I start to begin classes even at seven o'clock in the morning. I think I asked Barbara Forbes to teach a ballet class, you know, that I brought in a jazz teacher. So here I am, you know, walking up and down Broadway, you know, Broadway, scotch taping flyers to lamppost, walking up and down, you know, announcing what I'm doing in my studio. I mean, I'm that desperate. Can you imagine me going on the street, pasting these flyers to lampposts? I mean, I'm, that shows you where I was, okay? I was willing to try anything. So luckily I had, a, it was the first time I was invited to Denmark to teach at what was called the Bartolin International Seminar in Copenhagen. And my sponsor was Nina Grant, whom, if you remember, I had spoken so much about Lona Isaacson, uh, the most beautiful dancer, right, in the Harkness Ballet. And they were close friends. And um, so she invited me to come and teach students for two weeks in Copenhagen, and I had never been there. So it was great because the money was also very good. Uh, so the first time I teach the class, <laughs> after I teach, Nina says, I've never seen anything like it. <laughs> but, but she meant it in a good way, because you know, as I often, I tell you today, you know, I am from the moon. I don't teach the traditional way. So, and plus I was teaching uh, students from, uh, from Sweden, classical ballet students, and they all kind of went, you know. But, Again, this is something later, come, comes back again about 10 years later, 
The students grow up, they come to New York, and they say, you know, I finally understand what you were telling me. And it was really very good. <laughs> anyway, so what happens? Here I am. What am I going to do? So I'm really, you know, desperate. And I, I, I asked Carol Palmgarten, who was then the director of Steps. And I said, Carol, would you like to take over my studio? And she laughed at me. No internet. There's no internet, OK? So um, I tried doing this, and the director, Dennis Dime, he says, don't talk, you know, don't, don't talk. I don't want you to say anything. I just want to show the dancers. And it was Christine Redpath and Bill Solo and two other dancers. And um, you can show the exercise, but that's it, and just let them do it. So needless to say, they didn't sell well. Okay? So, but everybody loved my pianist, Bill Brown. So Bill says, why don't we make, um, you know, at this time a record. Remember those vinyl records? Um, and we will call it New Music for Your Ballet Class. So here it is. And that photo, by the way, was taken by a very famous photographer whom I didn't know at the time, John Lowengard, who just died. And he gave me permission to use his photos in my book. But he was a very famous photographer. <laughs> anyway. So, 1987, Carol Palm got from the steps. You know, she laughs at me, ha, ha, ha. No, I don't want your studio. It's your problem. And then I get a call from a man named Richard Elner, who I've never heard of. He says, can I over? Can I come over? Uh, I've got some ideas I'd like to discuss. And he is the owner, or was the owner, of the Broadway Dance Center. Because at that time, it was on Broadway, and 55th Frank Hatchett, you know, such a beautiful, friendly man, and his classes were so much fun. So he comes over, and he's wearing an Aloha shirt. And uh, let, me, let me show you what he looks like. So this is, this is Richard Elner. And um, he was a tap dancer, an amateur tap dancer. And he loved it. So he was a dancer at heart. But... The thing is that he owned this versatility t-shirt factory, uh, which made all the t-shirts for Lincoln Center and Broadway shows. So he had a very successful business. And um, so he, he gets right to the point. He says, why don't you come and teach for me? I'll take over your studio. I'll take over all your problems. All you have to do is come and teach at Broadway Dance Center, and you're going to just end up putting your money in the bank. So I had to think about it because I'd never worked for anyone else, you know. Uh, however unsuccessful I was, but since 1972, I'd been running my own studio. So I thought about it, and I tried to, you know, figure out the numbers. Okay, he's going to offer to pay me this much per class. You know, you get paid by the head. So I said, what have I got to lose? <laughs> I mean, I've already got, I mean, by that point, you know, I was so desperate, I applied to the University of Hawaii, I thought. I should go back to Honolulu, where I belong, and um, put Jason in a private school there. And uh, so I applied, and the university, th they rejected me. And supposedly they said, you're overqualified, you know. Um, so that was out. I had no place to go. So here's Richard Elder. So he's what you call a Buddhist god, a Shoten's engine. He steps into my life, and he offers me this job. And he was right. I ended up making more money than I ever did when I had my own studio. And you know, you must remember, I'm having to pay back now because I borrowed from the bank $50,000, which today is $100,000. So I was paying back that loan. I had to do that. I was paying for Jason's private schooling at Collegiate. And thankfully, my brother, Grafton, who's now passed away, was very wealthy. He was a banker. And so he really put up a lot of the bills. Plus, I was paying my wife a ago, we were divorced, I was paying her alimony. So it was like, you know, so much money I had to make here. So uh, the next day, I accept Richard's offer. And then I go to the Bartholomew Seminar in Copenhagen. And at that time, this is my second time there, Jason comes with me. And you know, this is before cell phones. So he's 11 years old, and he's skateboarding. And while I was teaching the class, he said, I'm going to go and skateboard in the park. So he does. And he meets a friend who invites him, you know, to his house. But luckily, Jason is so street smart, you know, growing up in New York, he doesn't do it. Because 
I would never know where he was. I mean, you know, there were, there were no cell phones. I had no telephone number, but you know, I, I trusted him at 11 years old. And as you can see today, he's very trustworthy. But anyway, um, so he got to go to Copenhagen and we had fun. We went to Tivoli. Um, anyway, so Richard built a studio, Studio X for me, and he layered it with six levels of plywood uh, underneath, you, you know what we call it, um, to make the floor sprung. And it was like a trampoline, because when you jumped on, you went boing, you know, and people, like when Ethan Stiefel came to class, he, he could touch the fan up there. Um, so anyway, um, what was special about Broadway Dance Center with Richard and Frank is that when Richard would finish working and when you came to class at night, he would stand there by the elevator and smile, say hello, how are you, and greet you. I mean, who does that today, you know? And he's the owner, but he just, he loved dances, and that was the thing you felt from him, that he respected us, and he would come downstairs later when I started class, and he'd like make me say, you know, I'm gonna take class today, you know, as a joke. But he loved it, and also what he had to love was that in, at this time, um, Jerome Robbins Broadway, was opening, so everybody had to get in shape for that. Plus, there were other shows like, um, um, after that, Bob Fosse's Dancing, right? So there were big dance shows, the Peter Allen show, I think. So I was in Studio X, which could accommodate 65 dancers. So when you signed in, they gave you a card. And you had to have the card because my class was packed. It was oversold, and there was a door there where people could just, where they would come in you know, and just lie on it. Because I began with floor exercises. You know, if you, um, if you see the classic classes three, or you see the ballet plus, I show you that. I did a 13 minute floor exercise and the, these dancers loved it. Because you know, after all the, the you know, the, the show the night before, and then getting up and then traveling on the subway, <clears throat> it gave them a chance to just kind of chill out, calm down, and then they could take class. So I had an, uh, and like an hour and 45 minute class. Packed, packed from wall to wall. Um, so here's a, so this, this was uh, Studio X. And as you can see, they, they were doing one of my floor exercises. I mean, I, I almost repeat today, you know, some of these exercises. But again, this was a mix of Broadway gypsies, professional ballet dancers, and amateur dancers um, at that time. Charlotte D'Amboise, you know, who's been a big star on Broadway. Uh, some names you recognize, Sergio Trujillo, who became now a choreographer, you know, Jersey Boys. Uh, what is it? Foot, he, he does, he's doing all these big shows, right? Andy Blank and Bueller choreographed Hamilton. You know, they were in my class, because at that, that time they were Broadway gypsies. Um, and among the professional ballet dancers, Gen Horiuchi from City Ballet, Philip Neal, Principal dancer, um, Ethan Stiefel, okay, from from the Joffrey, Tyler Walter, Jody Gates, who's now directing the USC program, Gloria Kaufman in California, and Adam Skloot, who's today the director of Ballet West. So all these people, you know, who are now successful today, were at that time studying with me, and um, also Gregory Russell, who's today uh, he worked for New York City Ballet. Uh, in the administrative, Johanna Snyder and Jennifer Goodman, they were in Joffrey, and they were in my first videos. So anyway, I returned to Copenhagen. I did three summers teaching in Copenhagen. And you know, the funny thing about Copenhagen, I arrived on a Saturday, and you arrive on Saturday, and at two o'clock, everything is closed, you know? <laughs> everything was closed. <laughs> Where am I supposed to eat? I mean, lucky I could find a restaurant. It was, it's not like New York, you know? So Co Copenhagen it was like a little small town, you know? Um, but anyway, um, it was good. The teaching experience was great. So then that last time I taught in the Royal Theater. So I was able to actually go on the stage where Bonneville had created his ballets, and the stage was so small. So I said, oh my gosh, you know, I understand now why they have their arms down, you know, because you can't lift your arm, you're gonna poke somebody out, and why they go forward, then they turn around, and mostly they're dancing up in the air, you know, <laughs> because the stage is so small, not like the New York State, or like, not like the Met, you know, and that explains 
his choreography. You know, he had to use what he had. So just so you understand that that's where that all comes from. Um, so it's 1989 to 1994. So Broadway dance had attracted a lot of Japanese students, excuse me, because it gave them a visa. So they don't understand English very well. So that's where I started to make my teaching tools. So what I would use is I had, that's why I invented my square, okay? Which you put here, you know, here to show you don't do this, right? So if I walk around the room showing this, that's the reminder for them. Don't move here. You have to lock your pelvis, okay? That's one thing. Then the next thing I discovered was for the pirouette. I discovered this, right? The spinning top. So I figured, because look what happens. Um, do you know this? Have you seen this in my videos? So, see, this is a spiral. So first of all, the first lesson is when you pull it up, it does not turn. It doesn't turn when you pull it up. And you see it's standing on one foot. So that also tells you. Um, this is not the prescribed shape for a dancer. <laughs> but you have to stand on one foot. You have to stretch up. And then you see this is a spiral. So this is the principle of turning, that you're making a spiral. In other words, if you want to turn right, you have to twist to the left. You want to go left, you twist to the right. So here is the lesson, though. You're on one foot, you stretch up, you have to twist, and then as you push down, you turn. And that's the formula, right? One foot, stretch up, twist, push down, and turn. And that is why I teach you all the time, I say, you must go to the end of the plie, all right? And the first time I did this, I said, oh my gosh, am I really going to do this? What are people going to think, you know? But you know how I got that idea? Because at that time, too, I studied, because again, videos, right? And I used to videotape, um, which I actually had to videotape Mozartiana, which was the ball last ballet that balancing choreograph. And it was danced by Suzanne Farrell and Eve Anderson. And in the middle of their duet, their part of it, they both do grand jeté en trelassé, you know, the jump to fourth position, and they prepare. And I ran it in slow motion. And they both look at each other, and they both do this, and they both do that, and they end up like this, with their arms open on a diagonal. And she's, you know, with her hair up and her earrings in her black and white, you know, tutu, in her point shoes. And they both do this at exactly the same time. And then they do one, two, three pirouettes. And I looked at it, I said, oh my gosh. Because no, be prior to that, we'd always been taught plie, pull up, right? Plie, pull up, pull up from the floor and use this arm, right? Use this arm, your supporting arm, to turn you around. Which is why it was so difficult for so many people to learn to pirouette, because they kept pulling their weight up from the floor and then pulling the arm in. So then that's how it probably developed. They said, well, you don't turn, do you? you then you can't do this solo. And you don't jump, so you can't do this. Because this time you were typecast. You either turned or you did, or you jumped. Because nobody taught you how to turn. However, of course, you know, before that, then David Howard, Joanna Nealon explained this idea, right? But to see Suzanne Farrell, you know, actually doing that, then that really said, okay, then I can do it. So I started to teach, I'm going to do this, and, and I put everybody through slow motion, and you promenade. So once they started to learn to prepare to finish the plie, and to push the floor of their feet, and to spot, right? So if I want to turn right, I have to twist left, and now I've even made it more simple for adult beginners, especially, who don't have much muscular strength and much turnout or flexibility. So I've even made it more of an idea of the preparation. So in fact, I tell them now to make like an S-curve. So I want you, if you want to turn to the right, I want you to twist back this way, and this front arm here, and I want you to make like the S, you know, like Superman or Superwoman. I want you, because when you do that, it's going to push your body farther over your toe. And then I want you to make sure, if you look in the mirror, I want you to make sure you see that you open the PA, 
So you end up in a second position, but your weight's on your front foot. Once you do that, your toes push, and you're going to turn. This arm can lead you around, and you're going to spot. And that is what works for adult beginners, especially, as I said, who don't have much muscular strength. More professional dancers, you know, who are so well-connected, their preparation can be more subtle because it's still coming from here, but you hardly see it. And they look like they hardly do anything. They just can do this, but they still, if you look at them in slow motion, they still do this. You have to turn the plie. You can't stay here and then go up and put your foot and then turn around afterwards, can you? So you have to turn to your back foot. So anyway, that I repeatedly emphasize. I did that, but also that's where I developed for Grand Chate, because we always used to finish the class, you know, tombe, pas de bourre, and step, step, Grand Chate, either sort of char, or we do chasse, Grand Chate, you know, with the bop mop, okay? And um, with most dancers, and still you'll see it today, they would only think, okay, I've got to get that leg up. I've got to get that front leg up. So what they didn't do, though, is that they didn't prepare. And then going all the way back, remember, in the Harkness, when I danced with Eric Bruin, and I told you I took films of him, as he jumped into the double sort of bosque in the air, how he leaned back and he stepped out. And then later I looked at Misha Brishnikov when he did his um, uh, variation in Don Q. And I ran him in slow motion. And he's like this. They're both leaning back. And that foot that is going to jump, you know, jump them in the air, their supporting foot, is way out there. It has to be in front of them. So that seemed to be the key. You've got to be back there because then you're going to go up and over. So I would use then, I mean, I had a bigger bow and arrow, but you know the idea of the bow and arrow, right? So if I just do this, the arrow's going to go straight, right? If I do this, the arrow's going to go down the floor. But if I do that, it's going to go up and over. And usually the arrow would land on the floor, all right? So in other words, you see this? So I said, this is your body. This is, these are your shoulders and your arms reaching back. So your foot that you're going to jump from is way out in front of you. And the distance, excuse me, the di this is the key, right, to jump. The distance from that supporting toe that you're going to push the floor, that is going to push your body up, the distance from that toe to your supporting shoulder back here, the distance, right, is this. You know, because you always have to have some kind of force. I mean, you can't just magically, you know, oh, I'm just going to go up. I mean, unless you have wires, you know. So you have to really prepare, right? So you want to jump up and over. So I say always, the cow jumped over the moon. The cow didn't go under the moon. The cow didn't go through the moon. The cow jumped over the moon. So I did this <laughs> one day in class at Broadway Dancer. And as I said, I had many Japanese dancers. And, you know, they're such good students. You know, they really thinking, especially because they don't understand English. So this one cute student, she's, she's looking at me, you know, and I aimed the arrow, you know, I, and, I, and I shot the bow, right? I shot the arrow, and it went, thunk. It landed right on her forehead. You know, it had a rubber tip, thank goodness, right? So, right boom, you know, usually it used to go on the floor, but I overshot it. So she, she's like this, you know, with the arrow sticking out of her head. So. Everybody was hysterical. So anyway, you know, I mean, thank goodness it didn't hit her eye, right? So again, I'm protected. I'm protected, right? Even with my crazy teaching method. So that's where my teaching toys came from. And I want to show you, because this is no longer, again, this is no longer here. This is the Broadway Dance Center, as it used to be. And this is between 55th and 56th, and actually, this studio up there was my studio, Studio X, and actually Madame Darvish taught in that studio as well, okay? And then later, when I began my adult beginner class, it was down here on the second floor over here. So you see, it was wonderful because people walking by in the street, they'd see all these dancers, you know? They're up there was B.B. Newworth and Charlotte D'Amboise, you know, people they'd seen the night before on, on stage, right? Anyway, next to us, here on the corner, was the first time Steps had their studio. It was a little studio, a little teeny studio. That's how they began. And today there's this huge factory, you know, on Broadway. So anyway, so we did that, okay? So I'm gonna go into now, I'm gonna start talking about
when I become a teacher and um, excuse me an artistic entrepreneur and we'll see how far I get you know okay I'm gonna because there's so much happening here that was so eventful so 1994 this turns out to be a life changer besides my ongoing classes at BDC I'm also teaching an advanced class at the old Alvin Ailey um, studios uh, it used to be on West 61st way over on West End and um, so I start teaching in the morning and uh, I have dancers from ABT the Cunningham and Lisa Monte companies and two stars of the New York City Ballet, Ethan Stiefel and Margaret Tracy. They were going together, and that's when I first met them. So I've been teaching at Broadway Dancer now since 1988. And as Richard promised, all I have to do is come to the studio, teach, and deposit my paycheck in my steadily growing bank account. And by that time, I think I was almost over paying back all the money I had borrowed for my chamber ballet. So after class one day, Denise Danielle, this lovely woman who had been taking my class, she's from Brick, New Jersey, and she has, she's been teaching for years, the D Denise Danielle Dance Studio. So she, she, she was a hoofer, mainly. Uh, she wasn't a classical dancer. So she comes up to me, she says, you know, Finest, why don't you be more commercial? And I said, well, what do you mean? She said, you know, I have a studio, and she had what you call, like, we call them a shopping mall studio, you know, which most dance studios are today. I mean, that's where it all began, right? In a, in a, in a parking lot, uh, you know, in the, like in a row of studios uh, of different stores, and she was, uh, that's where her studio was. So she said, why don't you show me, you know, because I wasn't a classical ballet dancer, so, and I have ballet students, so, you know, they can do the positions, and they can do the steps, but they don't look good. So why don't you make a video and show me, you know, step by step, you know, advance and progress the exercises so it starts from here, from A to Z. So I can then teach that to my students so they'll understand how they should work and what to do. So of course I went, I never thought of doing that either. I said, me? I mean, am I going to make videos, really? that ballet teachers are going to want to use. So, so the first question I ask myself is, okay, so how is it that some dancers look so graceful and relaxed and we love watching them and others are so clunky and stiff and they're boring? And how come some people can do it and some people can't? Um, so the first thing I realized is because good dancers never really stop between movements. Once the music starts, everything is one long movement. Does that sound familiar to you? The foot that ends one movement is the foot that begins the next. And now that's already been said, but what I saw and what I thought is actually what I've taught you yesterday in the um, Strength in Your Turnout is about over crossing the PA, and I keep telling you and all of you, you should go on YouTube and you look at the Royal Ballet, okay? Because they're wonderful. Uh, but I want you to look up uh, the, the, the ballet technique. And you look under Petit Allegro, P-E-T-I-T. -E Petit Allegro means quick little jumps. And you look up the glissade. And you're going to see these beautiful Japanese dancers today a principal, Akane Takeda. And she does the glissade. So softly and, and this one she's ending in fifth because she's only doing glissade to glissade to glissade but next she's going to make glissade jeté glissade assemblé so that's when the glissade becomes what we call then a precipité it becomes it's an auxiliary movement which leads directly into the set you know, it is the preparation for a jump and when you study that, you're going to notice that she does not do glissade and then a jeté. She doesn't do glissade, stop in fifth, and start a new step, and assemblé or jeté. But she does, and glissade, jeté, and glissade, jeté. Her, her glissade goes like this. It doesn't stop in fifth. And this is the Royal Ballet. 
This is the Royal Ballet, right? Perfection, okay? So, and since that time, I've seen other people, some people on, on uh, whatever, on the internet, and they're, they're saying this, but they're saying, and you must do Glissade Assemblé. But then when the teacher shows it, she does, and you do Glissade Assemblé, and she overcrosses. And you know why, then you can jump, because now that foot, that foot is over there, and it's ready to push you in the air instead of stopping in fifth, and then this is why so many dances, they look like anglissade, assemblé, anglissade, jeté. You see that batma, and then they clunk over sideways, but they don't go up, do they? So, that's the first thing I concentrate on, showing you, you have to overcross. And this, by the way, was called Basic Ballet um, 6, because I had begun five other videos which didn't sell at all, and I just, let them go. And this was called Connecting Movements Sideways and Forward. And I used Jennifer Goodman from the Joffrey. And you can get it, but it's only a DVD. And it's only on my website. Um, well, actually, you can't get it right now because we're not... You, you can get it on Amazon. You can get it on Amazon. So that one dealt with overcrossing. And I show you. And at that time, it's, it's a two-hour video, you know. And at that time, I could still demonstrate. So I'm showing you, you know, and I, I think I look pretty good there. You know, you can learn from me. And, uh, and Jennifer was wonderful, you know, wonderful to work with. Uh, because the Joffrey at that time was, I was uh, Broadway and 55th, and Joffrey was at City Center uh, on 56th and 7th Avenue, 6th Avenue, 7th Avenue. So the Joffrey dancers came to study with me too. So in that one, I did that. So that was one of the first things I, I dwelt on, as well as what I just explained earlier about the, the whole key was if you're going to go into a jump, you know, there's a preparatory, there's always a preparation, right? I mean, you can be in, in fifth position and do an assemblé or jeté, as most people do. And that's why they end up looking like jeté, jeté. They go from side to side. They don't really go vertically up, okay? So that first video, Connecting Movements, and I said connecting, right? Sideways and forward had to do with the glissade or the, today I say the step on there, going forward into the soda shop. And it begins with, you know, terra terra, just on the floor with tendu, then it becomes an adagio, then it becomes an allegro, and then it becomes jumping. So it progresses, you see, which is what Denise Danielle asked me to do. I did that one, and then I also did uh, connecting uh, basic ballet number seven, which is turning connecting movements and turning jumps. So that I use Joanna Snyder, and she is gorgeous. You have to, if you, ha don't, if you haven't got that video, you don't have it, you should get it. Because to this day, and this was, mind you, 1995, gorgeous, gorgeous. Her feet, her legs, and her, her classicism, her elegance, her beauty of movement. Joanna, I hope you're listening. Uh, she's, today she's Joanna Butoh. Um, but the videos took off like wildfire. I put an ad in Dance Magazine and teachers, and this time again, no internet, you know, so they have to call the 800 number. And this became my day job. I actually had to quit Ailey because I had to be home in the daytime because it was just me, because uh, by this time Jason was going to Vassar College. 40000 a year at that time, okay? So I'm working hard to pay for him, and luckily, again, my brother Grafton, to the rescue, helped me to pay, and also Jason was able to get a part scholarship. So you know Vassar College, as in Merrill Streep, and so many people, I think Viola Turner, did she go there too? Anyway, so many actors and actresses went to Vassar College, as well as smart people. Um, so anyway, those two videos you know, I could advertise in Dance Magazine, and I said, um, these videos are going to change the way you think about ballet forever. And they did, for a lot of people. In fact, Patrick Swayze, you remember him? His mother, uh, Patsy Swayze, she was one of my first customers. And, and she glowed, she glowed. She said, these are the best videos I've ever seen. So like that, that what started my business rolling. So that is how I began. And at that time, I was still at Broadway Dance Center, okay? So, 
That was the key, and I still teach this today, right? And you know that. Whether you take my beginner class or whether you, you Zoom with me, you take the stretch and strengthen your turnout class because I give that as an exercise, making you overcross the fourth position so you use those muscles and really strengthen your turnout. So this is that wonderful woman. This is my video angel, Denise Danielle. Still so smart and always dressing so beautiful. She is the loveliest woman on earth, you know. And um, if you like my videos, you can just say thank you, Denise Danielle. Because if she, see, she was another Shilton's engine, right? Because it never occurred to me, you know, I'm so busy teaching. I'm so busy spending money. I didn't think of how can I earn money, <laughs> you know. I mean, that was me still, you know, the dancer. Um, but you all thank you. See, thank you to Denise Danielle, because if she had never told me to do that, I would never have done this. I would never have made the more than 50 videos I've done to this day, okay? I wouldn't be doing my Zoom classes, you know? I wouldn't be doing this at all. It would never occur to me that I could teach you, you know, how to dance, how to do these things. So, um, then I know that, um, and anyway, I'm saying I have to do everything, right? I have to answer the phone, hello. At that event, I had to be incorporated. So I became um, the FJ, uh, finest, uh, ballet dynamics. I called it ballet dynamics. I said, dynamics, that's a good word, right? The workings, the, the, how, how dancing is powered, right? So that was my corporation, ballet dynamics. <clears throat> so I had to do my own advertising, and at that time I had Stefan von Milanitz, who I knew from way back, Chamber Valley USA, and who to this day, you see all these photos of me uh, that I use? Uh, Stefan takes them, Stephen, all right? So, um, then comes the work, okay? And this time you're videotapes. So there are these boxes, you know, video boxes, so heavy, right? And I have to, you know, pack them and mail them um, because I didn't, you know, I wasn't, that, remember I still had to pay for Vassar, uh, for Jason, right? Um, so I'm doing all the work myself. So I said, that's my day job. So when I would answer the phone, people say, is this, is this you? Is this finest? Because they were a little, you know, embarrassed that, how come he's, how come he's answering the phone? I, so I said, this is my day job. I'm on scholarship here, you know? Um, anyway, I loved it because I love, you know, hands-on. So um, this is um, Jennifer, who did um, Basic Ballet 6, and she was a beautiful jumper and just a nice, clean dancer. And I think later she did Clara in their Nutcracker. So also is a time when, I think it's here, 1996, okay, there we are. Um, so I talked about Joanna Snyder. Um, oh, also I did another video, right, after that, uh, with Joanna because she was so pretty, called Advanced Beginning Intermediate Point Class. And that is also on sale. You can stream it. And Joanna was so beautiful, you know, the beautiful feet, beautiful line, and just so natural, you know. And, and um, I mean, she still is today. She's a, she's a beautiful mother. So then I, 1997, I added on classes at Marymount Manhattan, like I didn't have enough to do. So. I think I was still teaching at Ailey, or then I went to Marymount, because Katie Langan, who you will call, was in my chamber ballet. And um, she is today the director of dance at Marymount. She's been there since 1997. So she said, why don't you come over and teach? So I said, okay. So there I am at Marymount Manhattan teaching. And then also, I started coaching Alexandra Ancinelli, who at that time was only 15 years old, I think. Beautiful, she's like Snow White. You have to look up some videos of her. Um, but she had come to Broadway Dance Center because again, she actually, she came to Broadway Dance Center, not for me, but to take um, um, modern dance from, um, not Bill Hotel, but I can't think of his name. Anyway. So then she came to my ballet class, and so pretty, you know. 
And uh, I didn't know who she was because she was still in the school. <clears throat> but when she was 15, well, then, oh yeah, then that Christmas I went home to Honolulu. And I opened the New York Times, and there's Alexandra's picture with, I think it was Damien Letzo, in Afternoon of a Fawn by Joan Robbins. And I said, wow, that's Alexandra, because she had asked me to start coaching here. So this is at the old Broadway Dance Center, uh, you know, in a little room, and not much space, but she didn't care, you know. And I talked her through the Afternoon of a Fawn, through Scott Symphony. Later in the morning, we went to City Center to rehearse, and at 9.30 in the morning, Alexandra would come in wearing this big hat, you know, and beautifully dressed, because she felt that's what a ballerina should be like. And of course, you know, all the other girls in the company said, ha, oh, look at her. And of course, they were insanely jealous because she went past them. She went past them and went right up to Solas and eventually became, you know, a ballerina because she could dance like the wind. So at 9.30 in the morning, she brings this little tape recorder, you know, the music song is like, <laughs> you know, it's, it's the New York City Ballet Orchestra playing, you know, whatever, Scott Symphony or uh, from Midsummer Night's Dream. And she would take off her hat, take off her coat, and she had to wear a huge plastic brace because she had severe scoliosis, right? So she'd take off the plastic brace and stand it on the floor, and she'd put on her point shoes, and she'd just go right into it. Cabriol, brise, and brise, and brise, and do, and turn, and do. You know, it was just amazing. Amazing to work with her because so smart. And she applied everything. And one of the ballets that Peter Mons created, uh, a, a trio, she had to walk across the, the stage on point, you know, and she had to do pique, pique, and she's walking into um, a light in the wings, right? She's doing pique, pique, batma, pique, pique, on toe, right? On toe, toe, and she never missed it. And you think how that's what you just do walking into a light like that. And see, so she could do anything, and she, she would risk anything. She would throw herself into every role. So it was so wonderful. Um, working with her, and uh, later <coughs> she left, and she joined the Royal Ballet, and she be became a ballerina there, and um, e eventually, sadly, um, she left, and she retired, and um, stopped dancing, but uh, again, that was such a wonderful experience, you know, so also on the weekends, I started doing touring, I started doing conventions, and uh, with New York on the Road, uh, they brought their own portable floor, and they brought their own bars, so it was almost like, because usually you know, all conventions taught on the, the rug, as you know, in a hotel. But in Arizona, we had the convention, and I met a small, young, blonde boy who was very talented. And I, and I said, so nice to meet you. I said, you're very talented. And of course, he turned out to be David Hallberg. <laughs> so well, you all know. So I've crossed paths with so many people coming and going, all right? But anyway, what I would do, you know, teaching a full week at Broadway Dance Center, and then the car would come for it, we'd go to the airport, I'd fly to San, I'd fly to San Francisco. And that weekend, the next morning, I'm teaching, Saturday and Sunday. Then that night, Sunday night, I fly out, I take the red eye and come back to New York, and I teach the next day. And I did that for several years, you know? You see why I have no hair? Um, but also, along the way, I saw so many dancers. And I said, they're all so dreadful. There's so many people, and they all want to dance, but they don't know what they're doing. So that further inspired me. And I said, you know, I have to, I have to keep making videos. I said, because these teachers, they don't know what they're doing. They don't know how to teach. They don't know how to help anybody. So it was still that same old thing of either you're talented or you're not. You can't do it, well, you don't get the part. Okay? Because I don't know how to teach you. All right? So, um, and then I made a class with Michelle Wiles. She had just won the gold medal at Varna, the junior Varna. She was 17, and she had been coming to my classes because she'd always come to New York from Virginia to do the conventions. 
and it's beautiful, you know, so beautiful, Michelle Wiles, and so talented. You know, turn, 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 pirouette, turn, 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 turn. So, so I did the intermediate advanced turning class with her. And that, by the way, I put up on YouTube anyway as a free video because I did it so long ago. But you should watch that too because she could do it. One, two, three, four, pirouette. One, two, three, four, you know, whatever, turn and jump. So that's how she became a ballerina. And today she has her own company called Ballet Next. So, you know, and here I am with um, beautiful uh, Joanna Snyder, right? So we could do everything. And again, the thing that I always made sure is that I worked with people who had come to my classes, who had looked for me and wanted to hear what I had to say. And this dancer is Noriko Naraoka. Oh, and you have to see her too, because she's in basic ballet eight and nine. This is called The Thinking Dancer. The Thinking Dancer working at the bar and the thinking dancer dancing in the center. And these were also two of our videos, which you can get. And you have to see her because, again, she is an extraordinary mover. So graceful, so beautiful. And um, she danced for a while for uh, Elliot Felt. And he started to create a solo for her. And Elliot, you know, was known for his temper. So, he was rehearsing Noriko, and the first day he got mad at her and he threw the chair across the room, she quit. <laughs> so she quit Elliot Feld. You know, she wasn't gonna have anybody throw a chair at her, Elliot Feld or not. So then she ended up working for Arthur Mitchell in Dance Theater of Harlem, which was uptown. And eventually she, for whatever her reason, she wasn't happy there, so she left. And then the next day, Arthur called me, and I knew Arthur because we were contemporaries. And he said, fine as you've got to send Noriko back to me. I love her, you know, but, but she wouldn't do it. So I also worked with very stubborn people, you see. Um, so anyway, I'm gonna leave you here in 1998 because this became another cross point. So in 1998, uh, Broadway Dance Center had to move because they're going to tear down the building and today it's a big office building. So we moved to 57th Street into the same building as the Hard Rock Cafe. And that place is also now torn down and another office building. So you know, you, you have to make sure you come to New York <laughs> at the right time or it's just gone. So unfortunately, um, just as he moved there and he opened the studio and again he was so proud of it. He built a sprung floor and it was just a clean room Nothing there, just a ballet studio. And um, then Richard had a heart attack. And uh, I have to say that before then, he used to often rent a yacht and take a group of us out there, the people that he liked. And then he would drive me home afterwards. So he was so generous and so thoughtful and uh, so considerate, you know. And he made that studio for me. It was supposed to be just a ballet studio. Um, so anyway, at that time, after he passed away, his daughter took over, and she was not a dancer, had nothing to do with dance. And so that started to change things because she filled it with offices. So that became another turning point for me um, where I had to make choices again because I wasn't happy there. So you tune in next week, and we'll go on to more dramas in my life. Um, but as you can see, it's been a wonderful life, and I've been very fortunate. So I want you to take good care of yourself, and please, you know, the, uh, the virus, you know, is still here, and you notice where there have been crowds of people. Well, people have gotten sick, and it's very dangerous because certain leaders are saying, I want you to come, you know, to my gathering, and you can't wear a mask. Um, so you have to be careful. You only have one life. You wear your mask and don't do what foolish people tell you to do, all right? I want you to take good care of yourself and I want you to know tomorrow, tomorrow we're gonna Zoom, okay? Um, age to find therapeutic stretches. So you must sign up, you know, for tomorrow's class. You have to sign up by 11 o'clock tonight. Otherwise it's closed because tomorrow's 11 a.m. And then on Sunday it's gonna be beginner ballet bar. And again, you have to sign up by 11 a.m tomorrow night, because it closes, all right? So people kept saying, well, I got cut out. Well, you got cut out because you didn't sign up, all right? So I hope to see you. Everything is going well, 
and we're meeting a lot of good people. So I want you to stay alive. Okay? Take care. Thank you.